We're pleased that you've tuned into this sermon. It's part of a larger worship experience here at the church. And our prayer is that as you listen, God has a word for you. So we are already to the second Sunday of Advent, and this is our uh, four-week journey of preparation and reflection as we look forward to welcoming once again the, the Christ child into the world. We look forward to celebrating Christmas Eve and Christmas, but we recognize, you know, there needs to be some preparation and some reflection as we... Uh, really consider how it is we can welcome him once again into our world and into our lives. And our scripture lesson today is a familiar one to most of us, particularly this time of year. It's uh, from the gospel according to Luke, and it's, it's an account there, uh, one of the uh, early traditions of the church, that uh, Mary received a visitation from an angel of the Lord, a messenger, Gabriel. And in that encounter, uh, she received some marvelous news. So, from Luke's Gospel, first chapter, our lesson for this morning. As I read, listen for God's word to you. Now, in the sixth month, the angel of Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Now, the virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. Now, she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus, and he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible for God. And then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. We started out a worship this morning with our opening liturgy and a question. Uh, what are you afraid of? Now, I think most of us, if we choose to, can answer that question quite easily, right? Because our fears are, well, they're pretty present to us, aren't they? We ponder them. They concern us. Uh, we lay awake at night thinking about them. When we're asked, what are you afraid of? We can answer that question quite easily if we choose to. And an interesting thing is that there are all these studies which show we are very reluctant to share with other people our fears. Does that surprise anyone here? We're very reluctant to share our fears, what we're really afraid of, with other people. Why is that the case? Well, because we know if somebody knows what we're afraid of, they can manipulate us. And so we tend to share our fears only with people that we really trust. You may think for a moment if that's true in your life. And that's also why fear, and particularly what Americans are afraid of, is something that's pretty widely studied and analyzed. There are a lot of different research projects going on at any given time trying to figure out what we Americans are afraid of. Uh, one study that was just completed uh, was performed uh, by Chapman University down south. And they have come out with their list of the top things that we are afraid of for 2023. Do you want to see it? <laughs> Can you bear it? All right, here's the top five. These are the five categories. All right. So number one, corruption in government. That surprised me. Uh, economic concerns, war and terror, a harming or death of loved ones, 
uh, and pollution of drinking water, which just seems kind of random, but maybe that's a larger category, right? So, and these tend to move, by the way. So this year, what they found is harming or death, injury, illness, sickness to loved ones, and pollution, those dropped. And what rose? Corruption in government, economic concerns, war and terror. Any guesses on that one? Well, A, what's going on in our world, but also we're heading into an election year. And those tend to be things that we're going to be hearing a lot more about, so they're top of mind. It's not a surprise to anyone here we're heading into an election year, right? <laughs> now, fear is fortunately uh, pretty easy to understand and uh, define. Uh, there are no shortage of resources out there to help us get a definition of what fear is. Uh, this one that I found from uh, the Oxford Languages resource I think is quite serviceable. Here's the definition of fear for us. Fear, an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat. What I think that definition reminds us of is that fear is an emotion, right? It's a perception that we have in response to something that we believe to be a threat to our health, our safety, our future prosperity, uh, something that might cause us pain. Uh, it's an emotional response, though, and I love it, it's uncomfortable, right? And oftentimes, we don't get much of a choice as to what we are uh, afraid of, do we? It just comes upon us, and we have to deal with it. I remember when I was in high school, uh, there was this large family gathering in our house, and uh, one of my cousins from across the room called out because he was looking through a family picture album. He said, Peter, you look just like your Grandpa Stuart. Now, I'd never met my Grandpa Stuart because he, he, he passed right before I was born, but uh, he held up the picture and said, you look just like him. And a split second later, my aunt on the other side of the room said, well, Peter, enjoy your hair while you have it. Because <laughs> Grandpa Stewart was bald as a billiard ball by the time he was 30. <laughs> See, this is why we go to family reunions, <laughs> is to be reminded of our genetic destinies. <laughs> and let me just tell you, that's not a thing you want to hear in high school. So for the next several years, I didn't just comb my hair in the morning, I examined it. <laughs> and I would look at the comb and see how many hairs uh, had uh, retreated from my head to that comb. Now, uh, uh, that fear didn't come to pass, at least not yet. And, and that's, of course, something about fear, isn't it? We, we can experience it. Uh, it's a perception that comes upon us. It's an unwelcome, it's an emotion, but what we fear doesn't always come to pass. In fact, in most cases, it doesn't come to pass. But it's still real, and we need to contend with it. Now, it's interesting to me that in reading the Bible, in so many instances, when a person is being visited by a divine messenger, or when God shows up in the world and is is doing something or about to do something, when people have an encounter with something that they believe to be as God's presence or of God in this world, the immediate response is what? Fear. And that, that doesn't compute for us right away, does it? Because, I mean, the Bible's pretty clear. God is love. And so when God shows up, even when it's to hold us accountable, or even when it's to correct something, the scriptures teach us, uh, that should be something that we, we see as a grace. That the world is not abandoned, it's not left to its own devices, but God is engaged. If we, if we experience something we believe to be God's impending presence or action in this world, that's a grace, that's a gift. And that means we should respond to it with joy and not fear. And that tension between fear and and joy responding to news that God is about to do something in this broken down world of ours 
is really the central tension in a lot of ways in our scripture lesson this morning. Because as the story opens up, the angel Gabriel is all about grace. I mean, he's, he's one happy angel. I don't know if angels are happy or not, but he, he clearly is, right? He's filled with a sense of grace or giving that God is about to fulfill a prophecy a given long years previous through the prophets uh, that God is going to act and that through the birth of this child, Jesus, we will see something new, Emmanuel, God who is with us, God's very presence in the human condition. And that Mary has been chosen for reasons we're not privy to, but she has been chosen to be the instrument through whom God is going to bring about this great uh, entrance into the human condition, this incarnation which will change everything. Uh, Gabriel sees this as grace. And so it's reasonable to expect he might have thought the response would be joy, but it's not. Mary is what? She's afraid. The word there that is translated in the English as perplexed in the original Greek means something more like freaked out. <laughs> and, and Gabriel addresses that, her fear. So we should probably ask the question, why is she afraid? If this is a grace of God that she's hearing about, if God is on the move in human history, if something new and wonderful and remarkable is about to take place and she's been chosen to play a role, why fear? Well, I think that the easiest response is an obvious one. I mean, we're not told in the story itself, but the, probably the easiest reason we can come up with uh, as to why Mary is fearful is that she's in the presence of an angel. And that doesn't happen every day. And it's understandable that that would put somebody a little off their feed and kind of make them very nervous and unsettled. Can we all agree on that? People have said to me from time to time, you know, I can't really take the Bible seriously because, you know, the angels are showing up all the time and there's all this kind of supernatural, miraculous activity. But, oh no. <laughs> Even by biblical standards, an appearance of an angel is very unusual. That's something that's going to shock a person. So we could see her fear related to that, but I think there's something else going on here, definitely in the context of the story. And that something else is that Gabriel and his message and his invitation represent a grand, great, divine disruption to Mary's life. And that's something that's going to make anybody fearful. See, Mary perhaps is a lot like us. You know, she made plans for her life. She's a young woman, yes, but she had worked hard to develop skills and abilities that were appropriate to her time and to her context. She was uh, proud of her reputation, which she had presented in a very particular way. She had worked hard to be a valuable member of the community. She's engaged to be married to Joseph. We don't know much about that, but it's reasonable to see that she is busy making plans, at least in her own mind, for the future, what their life will be like, how their family might get started. Mary has made plans. She's kind of laid out her life the best she can. And so what Gabriel represents is this divine intrusion, this interruption, and all of her plans are now in jeopardy. And we don't tend to like that and that causes us fear when it happens. And I think there's some of that going on in the story as well. We can see how focused in she is on the tactical nature of her life and how it's developing and where it's going to go by the question she asks of Gabriel in response to his declaration. And that is, how can this be since I'm still a virgin? I mean, she, she's concerned about her reputation, right? What's this going to mean for her and the plans that she's made? But that's where Gabriel responds with a follow-up. And there's somewhere in that second address that Mary changes. And this graceful interaction from the angel Gabriel of God's action, impending action in human history to change everything, moves her from fear to joy. 
And she declares confidently to Gabriel, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And it's for that reason that Mary is often presented in the tradition of the church as the first disciple. Did you know this? She's often presented as the first disciple. And, and, and this is with regard to her own son because she was the one who first heard about God's plan to send himself to come in the form of Jesus and to heal and restore all things. She was the one who first heard about that plan and said, yes, she is the one who bears Jesus into the world. And in a lot of ways, that's really a wonderful way for us to think about the ministry or the mission of the church moving forward. And that is we, we still have the responsibility of bearing Jesus into the world. That's what we're called to do. The Apostle Paul saw this so clearly. In 1 Corinthians, he wrote the following verse. Now you, meaning the church, are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So Paul conceived of the church as a group of people who had come together around a shared confession of faith in Jesus Christ who are then committed to bearing his work, his presence into the world. That's what we're called and formed to do. And what that means is, as we read the Gospels, and we hear about how Jesus was out there healing people and restoring them from broken places, as he was loving people unconditionally, breaking down walls and barriers that were put up around race and creed and anything else, as he was engaging concretely acts of peace and reconciliation, as he was calling out injustice, as he was constantly working to proclaim the kingdom of God and invite people to enter in knowing that they were forgiven and restored through him to a right relationship with God. Those are the very things that the church is called to do. And what that means is that God is going to show up from time to time, might not be so dramatic as an angel, but God is going to show up from time to time with an invitation for us to do something in this world of ours to meet a need, to bind up someone who's brokenhearted, to be an advocate for a group of people who cannot defend or protect themselves. Maybe think for a moment. Has there been a time in your life when you felt that God was calling you to something? Have you ever felt that God was putting something on your heart to reach out to someone in your neighborhood, in your family? to meet or address a particular need or concern that, that you just kept noticing or paying attention to? Have you ever felt that God was calling you to bear something of the love and the justice of Jesus Christ into this broken world of ours? Because if it is true that Christ rose again, and through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he is here, he is with us, he is now, and he is the head of the church, then he is going to be calling us to service. And what Christians are always invited to fear is not so much that when God calls, our lives will somehow become inconvenienced and our plans will be disruptive, and we should fear that life isn't going to go exactly the way we had thought it was going to go. No. No. The fear we should be more concerned with is that God might just call us to something, but we were too busy and too distracted to say yes, to say with Mary, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Oftentimes we can think that God uses other people, amen? Amen people that are smarter, richer, more powerful than we are? That's not true. Mary is our big example of that, and I'll close with this. We tend to think that God can only use other people, but God can use anyone, anytime, who's willing to be used. Mary's our great example of that. Again, the Apostle Paul saw this in a passage of Scripture that I know he intends to be encouraging, but must have been very insulting at the time, where he speaks to the church at Corinth, and he wants them to know that they're not the brightest bulbs in the box. They're really not that impressive a group of people. 
So he kind of insults them, but then he wants them to know, but that's exactly who God chooses. Here's what Paul had to say. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But guess what? God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. This is the time of year where we exalt Mary and we extol her and we lift her up as a model and an exemplar. And I think if Mary was here today, she'd say, okay, I, I don't think I need you to worship me. Maybe you can learn from me, though. I had my life mapped out, planned out. I think everything was figured. And then there was this divine disruption. Yes, I was afraid at the invitation to be called into service. It took me back a bit. But you know I was able to embrace it in joy. I was able to move beyond that fear of disruption, even divine disruption, and say, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Advent is a time for us, you see, to ask the question, are we listening for the call? And when it comes, what are we prepared to do? Amen. We invite you to get to know our community better. You can do that by exploring our YouTube channel and do hit subscribe and check notifications so we can send you any future updates. You can also explore our community of faith at the church website, lopc.org. And we hope you know there's always a place for you here.